Welcome to the North Forge Discovery Series, everybody. My name is Tina Lee, and I'm the Marketing and Events Specialist here at North Forge. For today's webinar, we'll be taking a deeper dive into income and sales taxes, as this is our second of two webinars about tax filing. Before we begin the webinar, we acknowledge that we're reading that we are meeting virtually on the ancestral lands of Treaty One territory, their traditional gathering place of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the traditional homeland of the Red River Métis people. For those of you who are new to our webinars, North Forge is the innovation partner for the province of Manitoba and an incubator accelerator supporting the growth of Canadian science-based, technology-enabled and advanced manufacturing startups from the ideation stage all the way through to acceleration. We fuel Manitoba's economy, providing entrepreneurs with industry-leading mentors, award-winning growth coaches and rock star subject matter experts in our fourth stage founders program. North Forge also has North America's largest nonprofit publicly accessible fabrication lab located right here in downtown Winnipeg. The Fab Lab has in excess of $3 million of advanced manufacturing equipment that has helped more than 3,000 entrepreneurs develop over 7,500 prototypes since 2011. The North Forge Discovery Series are free events that we host in conjunction with promotion of our Founders Program. If you have a business idea and would like to find out more about our Founders Program, please visit our website or reach out to our Program and Communication Manager, Krista Kowalik, and I'll place your contact information in the webs uh, and, and our website in the chat shortly. And with that, I welcome Michael Glazier, CPA and CA and founder of Glazier Accounting. In 2005, Michael graduated with a Bachelor of Commerce with a double major in Marketing and Accounting from the University of Manitoba. Post-graduation, he moved to Victoria and worked with Tree Home Company, where he successfully researched, planned, and implemented a conversion to paperless uh, to a paperless office while completing his chartered accountant designation. His proudest moments are when he could eliminate the file rooms and convert square footage into revenue-generating space as a senior manager at Winnipeg-based Brook and Partners. Michael feels that knowledge is meant to be shared and that strong engagement amongst the community, employers, staff, and management makes everybody stronger. He has been able to expand his practice to the community by mentoring new business at Futurepreneur and participating in wrap-up weekends as an advisor and teaching courses at Entrepreneurship Winnipeg. And with that, welcome, Michael. The floor is now all yours. Thanks for the introduction there, Tina. I'm just going to share the presentation back on. Uh, and fair warning, my daughter decided to keep uh, me up to about 4.45. So if I start speaking in tongues or staring into space, just yell in my ear, please. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the I don't want to overpay a deeper dive on income taxes and sales taxes. Uh, yesterday's course, for those of you who attended, who I think is most, if not all of you, uh, was on more of the administrative you know, ways of paying and filing taxes and deadlines, et cetera. Uh, but I did not spend time on some of the nuances of taxes and, and, uh, and various things um, on it. And so, this is what this course is meant to cover. And just to let you know, a lot of this content normally took a day for the three day entrepreneurship Matt Toba course when they're offering that to go through. We're going to do it in like 40 minutes. So, yeah. Uh, the goal with this is not to make you an expert, uh, it's to just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and build awareness so that when certain triggering events happen, you might remember, oh, there's something I need to think about with this. Maybe I should go talk to someone. Uh, I would not worry. I always tell clients, everyone thinks they should know taxes somehow. Um, I have doctors that are saying, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I don't know my taxes bear. I say, I don't know how to diagnose cancer, man. Like we each have our thing. So, you know, like there's no, if you, no one's ever taught you this, if you've never taken courses, then accept that you either need to research or find someone to teach you. And that's, that's okay. You're already wearing like 10 hats as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, find someone that you can pay to take a hat off you if, if you can. Um, in any case, uh, as Tina said, I am Michael Glazier. I've been doing this for about 17 plus years now. Um, 
And I've spent that whole time in public practice with owner managed small business uh, and taxation. Um, and usually I'm familiar, you know, with anything that's not public companies or foreign taxes to a degree, uh, because that's outside my wheelhouse. Today's content, we will be covering some pros and cons of the various business structures available in Canada. Um, that is usually one thing people either get paralyzed on or they pick something that's maybe inappropriate for them um, because they don't know what they need or what some of those decisions happen. Number two is we're going to discuss the calculation of income taxes, including uh, the marginal tax brackets, you know, how some different sources of income are taxed, uh, what is deductible, uh, and this is all with a focus on, you know, small business, of course. Other is tax deductions versus tax credits and treatment of capital assets as well. Well, there's also um, some special tax credits that are available that can really change either your structure decision or even some of your budgeting because often people don't know what's available or they might not think it applies to them and they leave money on the table. Uh, one big one is the scientific research and experimental development tax credits, which is a federal program, but there are some provincial ones as well, uh, which I'll be referring to as SHRED, uh, just to save my voice. The other one uh, that often comes up in Manitoba is the manufacturing investment tax credit, which is a, a refundable uh, Manitoba tax credit. Well, it has a non-refundable portion too, but Manitoba tax is zero for uh, for small business, so you're never going to apply a tax credit against zero taxes. Uh, there's the Manitoba Interactive Digital Media Tax Credit. That one is often missed um, before the fact, and many things qualify, but you have to kind of do it proactively. And finally, the Manitoba Small Business Venture Capital Tax Credit. Uh, this one is vital if you're trying to go out and uh, if the nature of your business is to go out and get some investors in Manitoba to throw in some money, um, because they're either going to be aware of this or it might let you um, sweeten the pot, if you will, by letting, by giving them some of the investment back in the form of a tax credit on their personal tax returns, which maybe they'll lend you more money or be more willing to knowing that, you know, uh, like up to 45% of their risk, if you will, has already been paid back in terms of tax credits. There's GST, HST, whoops, and Manitoba RST. Uh, I covered this yesterday, but I'm going to touch on the registration requirements again, uh, a little bit deeper on the place of supply rules, which is the one area that people always mess up on. Uh, and we're going to discuss exempt and zero rated, what that means, that's for GST, and self-assessing for RST, because that's an area that often get people get hit on audit um, on that. And Manitoba Finance really loves to audit people before their four-year period ends, uh, because they know they're going to catch stuff like this. So it can be a bit of a surprise. And the final um, discussion will be on remuneration. Uh, in particular, this has to do with corporate um, amounts because partnerships, joint ventures, uh, sole proprietors, there's no decision. You make money, you owe tax on whatever your portion of that money is. Uh, if it's on personal taxes, the end. Um, whereas corporate, there are some advantages and disadvantages and things for different types of remuneration. There's not necessarily a right or wrong or best way to do it, um, it's all, but I do like to discuss the variables so that you can uh, kind of make your own decision as to what you want, because what you do now could impact what, what money you have in retirement related to your business, um, as well as some treatment of shareholder loans, because that, that gets confusing with a lot of people as well. So that's today's itinerary. Are there any questions on any of those topics, or even is there any sort of topic that uh, point out from this that people were hoping to see that maybe I haven't considered um, as, you know, time permitting, I, I would be more than happy to answer. You can leave it in the chat or pipe up right now. It's your choice. Okay. Okay, business structures. 
So the most obvious and, and what most people tend to start as if they aren't overthinking it is sole proprietor, which is just, I'm an individual. I took on a contract. I'm not an employee. Someone's paying me to do something. By default, I am a sole proprietor or contractor, or whatever you want to call yourself, but you're self-employed at that moment. You might even have an employment, but you are now self-employed. And this uh, adds to a lot of stuff. Now, a lot of times people think, oh, I have to go register. Do I have to go through the Manitoba office and register as a proprietor? No, you don't. The minute someone pays you, even if it's for shoveling their driveway, uh, you are a contractor. You are a self-employed person and a proprietorship. Um, now, what a lot of people do when they're registering is they're securing a business name within Manitoba so no one else can you know, scoop it and, and give you a cease and desist. Um, so th there's value with that, but it's, it's, you don't have to do anything before you sell in this case. Um, you just do. Uh, so this one has minimal legal and accounting costs. That's a nice pro uh, because the required reporting on personal tax return is limited to what's your revenue? What's your expenses by category? And that's not an exhaustive list. These are all on the form T2125 if you want to Google it off series website. What's your business use of home and or automotive expenses uh, related to business during the year? What capital assets have you bought? So, you know, in the one I'm doing a tax return, those are what I ask people to provide me so that I can you know, put it into the tax return. Generally, it's not a lot of work. I don't need to make sure their accounting is correct. I don't need to disclose the assets or liabilities on the personal tax return or generate a balance sheet or financial statements. As a consequence, it's substantially cheaper, maybe $250 for tax returns instead of something else, you know, instead of like $2,000. Um, so long as the work is good. Now, for the cons, the big one that people are often not aware of, and depending on the nature of their business, can get them in big trouble, is you have unlimited legal liability by default. All your personal assets are at risk to settle any business debts or lawsuits. Uh, to the extent that you're not covered by insurance or you go and buy a bunch of inventory or whatnot that you owe to creditors, if they're even if they're unsecured creditors, they can sue you and take your personal assets. So if you don't own anything, you don't have a house or renting or whatnot, you might not care. If you have stuff, that could be a bit of a sleepless night to consider. So, you know, that is a, a bit of a big deal. But again, depends. If you're operating a brick and mortar store location, that could be a big deal. You could have a lot of lawsuit liability just from the physical space. If you're you know, a programmer or a consultant that's just works on the phone all the time for an office in your home, not as much of a concern on that, you know, you're like unlikely to be sued. So you have to look at your own situation. Uh, another big con is there's no opportunities for tax deferrals because all your income is taxed as part of your personal income, whether you used it for personal purposes or it reinvested in the business. So you are paying the maximum amount of tax in this year immediately on that income. And you're supposed to report on an accrual basis unless you're a farmer or a fisherman, uh, which means that you're also supposed to include any receivables that you might not have been paid for, um, but also any expenses you haven't paid for as well um, as revenue and expenses. So that could be a bit of a pain if you're paying you know, 45% of money you haven't collected yet. Uh, on top of the income tax rate, proprietors are required to pay both the employee and employer portion of CPP. In 2022, this is 5.5% each for a total of 11%, which is added to the basic tax rates. And the lowest combined tax bracket for proprietors in Manitoba is 25.8%. So at 11, right out of the gates, your tax rate is 36.8% without the inclusion of any basic tax credits or other items. So pretty substantial holdback you have to make. And that CPP, it's going up and up um, and the amount, but currently it's on roughly 60 to 63,000 of income. So you're paying that until you hit that income level. Okay, partnerships. Uh, it's effectively treated the same as a, as a sole proprietor, just involves two or more people. 
Um, you can have specialized agreements in them, but if you just choose to do business together and you're not shareholders in a corporation, you're kind of in a partnership by default, right? I'm not going to get in the legal side if you were suing each other back and forth, but you know that that's kind of the arrangement. It's reasonably simple to set up basic partnerships. And if all the partners are individuals, there's minimal reporting because you just share report your share of the income on a personal tax return. Uh, as a proprietor, and then you as the partner are allowed to um, deduct anything you spent out of your own pocket that wasn't a partner reimbursable expense that you spent to make money like business use a home, etc. Um, and you pay the net. So there's usually less legal costs on simple partnerships if you do have to have an agreement, but that goes up depending on the amount of stuff you want in the agreement. And I highly recommend if you're going into business with someone that you always have whether it's a partnership agreement or a unanimous shareholders agreement, um, just, you know, it's like a prenup, but even if you bring it up, um, I, I follow a, a recommended policy of, you can't stop someone from stabbing you in the back, but try not to hand them a knife. Uh, and this is where the knife is in a lot of places is a lack of agreement um, or verbal agreements because people will always, and you yourself will misremember it to your advantage, or someone can have a stroke or they can die and suddenly their spouse is the one you're in business for because they inherited your share. So having terms in place to, um, to know what to do in those situations is very, very important when you're in business with other people. And it's hard to layer in when disagreements are in place. It takes a special brand of monster though to say that no that thing that i signed is not what i meant to sign and and that's totally wrong later so you know where they can misremember a, a conversation all day long now they're very flexible in terms of setting income split terms like you could write in that partner a gets an extra 10 percent of the income if the year end date falls on a full moon so long as jupiter is visible in the night sky it would be insane and I'd question your san like I would question you severely why you would need that, but you could. It, it's like very, I have seen some partnership arrangements on large real estate deals that had like a cascading income flow, you know, based on amounts if they were sold now with interest rates like this based on amounts that people had put in before, very confusing. Um, and it was the guy who wrote it just rigged it so he'd get a bit more money, but it was, uh, it, he could do that. It was well within the, the rights. Um, you can also set up what is called limited partnerships, uh, which provide limited liability protections to investor partners as opposed to general partners. These are very useful if you are doing any real estate developments or if you're in a professional firm, or if you're in a situation where you're trying to raise money and you're you know, from a bunch of investors and there's a possibility of them moving in and out, it's a bit easier to do that than a corporation because you're not working with shares or working with partner capital, which isn't distinct um, in the same way shares have to be. Uh, so, and you are allowed to write in whatever terms so you're not under corporate law. Uh, so it is a, but they are very expensive to set up, you know, based on the terms you have. Um, the cons, all partners and general partnerships have unlimited personal liability for actions of the partnership and their other partners. Even if the actions weren't authorized, if your partner goes out and borrows a million bucks and then the business closes, you're on, you're liable for that, even if you had nothing to do with it. Uh, it can be very expensive for legal fees and accounting fees if the comp, if it's a complex partnership structure, if it's development deals, if and if you have corporate partners present, there's a corporation between the individual and the partnership. Uh, then there's special partnership information return and slips known as T5013s. Uh, that need to be filed. So then you're basically at the same cost as a corporation anyways. It's not a tax return, but if you've had investments in certain you know, oil and gas stuff, you probably receive T5013s because they've been arranged as partnerships on your personal returns. Again, no opportunities for income tax deferrals because partnerships are flow through entities. It's the partner who gets taxed, not the partnership itself. Um, although it is considered distinct, I guess, for some legal purposes. And the CPP is again present on the partner's share of business income earned. 
Uh, now, if the partnership happens to have real estate rent or investment income earned through partnership, it's not subject to CPP because it maintains the nature of the income that flows through. Those are considered investment income tax, not earned income for purposes of the pension plans or RSPs or anything like that. Any questions on partnerships, proprietors so far? No, okay. Joint ventures, very similar to partnerships. Uh, they're very flexible, again, in terms of splitting income. They are not distinct legal entities in the same way partnerships are. They're simple to set up. There's no, the uh, agreements can become very complex. Again, depends on the project. Uh, and there's no filing requirements. Even the GST, you can't even get a GST number for a joint venture. You actually have to report under a partner's GST number. Uh, because again, they are not a distinct entity uh, according to CRA. Um, so incomes reported on the tax return for each venture. Now the cons, they're generally not meant for long-term relationships, used for short-term projects or testing of relationships. You know, if you're not sure if you want to be in business with this person or do a merger, set up a little bit of a joint venture. So that way, if it doesn't work out, you've kind of, you know, it's like moving in with someone, but you keep the lease on your apartment so you can get back out. You know, you don't have to combine all your stuff day one if you don't know if it's going to work out. Uh, and again, there's no inherent tax deferral options. You, a venture can be a corporation, which does have inbuilt deferral opportunities. And that's the same with partnerships, actually. Um, Again, you kind of have to think about what you're working on if you want to do joint ventures or co-ownerships. You see a lot in real estate. Now, the big one where things get complex and people think sometimes they need to set this up or, or not um, is the corporation. Hence why it's taking a full sheet. The pros, you have built-in legal liability protections. You can only lose what you have put into the business unless you have personally guaranteed something or certain loans. There are certain actions, like if you shut the business down and you had unpaid source deductions or GST, those can, the, Siri can go after directors for those because you effectively misused uh, amounts you collected in trust for Siri. So that has some li director liability attached to it. Um, but you know they won't go after income tax in the same way because that's not monies and trust. Uh, you do have some potential income splitting options with uh, spouses um, and lifetime capital gains deduction claim on sale of a business, which is you know eight hundred thousand and change. If you sell the shares personally, if you have a holding company in between, you can't sell the shares and get that. It has to be an individual selling shares, subject to a certain certain tests. Uh, that you held the shares for two years, that you, it, during those two years, more than 50% of the assets were used in an active business. And right at the time of sale, 90% of the assets, fair market value, were used as an active business. Uh, this can be an issue if you're accumulating a lot of excess cash um, inside the corporation or investing in you know, vacant land that's unrelated to your business or real estate properties in the corporation. Uh, because that can, you know, make it impure for purposes of the capital gains deduction. In those situations, we'll usually layer in some additional things like family trusts or whatnot. So you can purify the corporation by moving the income out of that corporation into an investment corporation, but still maintain, you know, personal ownership of some or all of the shares. Uh, again, that's a far more, it's a good problem to have, but it's a far more complex item. Uh, you have tax deferrals available. The combined federal Manitoba corporate tax rate is 9% on the first 500,000 of net income earned by the corporation. That's huge. It means it, every time you make a dollar in the corp, you have 91 cents after tax, after, you know, after expenses to reinvest in the corporation, which is why it's so low. And you can also use that to invest in investments, real estate, whatnot. Um, you know, so compared to 36.8% at the low end uh, as a proprietor, that's, you know, 27% more money that you have available to reinvest in your business um, or to invest in the future uh, as long as the money stays in there. So that can be huge. And until you pull it out, you don't have to pay personal income on it. it, it as long as it's within the corporate umbrella, you can be earning investment income on 30% more money for 25 years and then pull it on retirement. 
they put some rules in place against income splitting uh, for especially with service in companies to spouses or adult children, uh, which was pretty common before so that you could get dividends into, you know, other people's hands that aren't necessarily involved in the business. Uh, so that went away in like 2018 or so. Um, but the, depending on the nature of the business, if you're running retail or if the person, the family member is involved like 20 hours or more per week and you know paid fair market value, then you do have some income splitting options. You also can have a spouse as a shareholder. And then when you turn 65, they are actually allowed to start income splitting what you saved for retirement in the company with the spouse uh, with dividends once you're over a certain age. So uh, if you are setting up a corporation, you I didn't put this in here, but um, a lot of people go set it up themselves. I recommend a lawyer. People try to save money. They usually wind up paying the lawyer to set the minute book and the articles of amendment later. Uh, but if you want to pay dividends to um, different shareholders, uh, you have to set them up with separate classes of shares. Because when you declare a dividend, uh, you it, it is paid on the class of shares, not to the individual. Um, you know, and and split amongst all the shareholders of that class. So if you want the option to only pay yourself or pay your spouse, uh, they need like you have to hold class A common voting shares and your spouse has to hold class B common shares of some sort, voting or non-voting, so that you can choose who you want to pay or only ever pay yourself, you know, until retirement. And then you can start paying dividends on the class B shares. So there's various different ways to structure that. I'm not going to go into all the options. It depends on your circumstance. You might want to set up multiple corporations if real estate is involved, separate businesses, you know, things of that nature, maybe even holding companies if you're running a lifestyle business that you're just going to build up cash in and, and retire with as opposed to selling it. Um, don't put a holding company in place uh, if you're just trying to develop some technology to sell because it's unnecessary and you will have removed the capital gain deduction. I, some people have recommended it um, and there's no sense in doing that. Um, I, I sometimes think people are just trying to get more professional fees for having more corporations set up. Um, but you can always layer in a holding company with a tax-free rollover, um, but uh, using certain things, but you can't go, you can't get the holding company out without a taxable transaction. So, you know, start simple and then layer in if you need it. Uh, the cons, you need full financial statements with the exception of the cash flow statement. Uh, balance sheet and income statement is required as a minimum for inclusion in the corporate tax return. So you have to have it usually prepared by an accountant. Um, you have to answer a question on the corporate tax return that actually says, did a third party accountant prepare this or someone related to it? So if you're saying no designation, yes, I'm inside the corp, I'm, I'm uh, related to the corporation. This probably goes in the more likely to audit pile if you owe some stuff. Um, that's, I believe, Giphy Form 141 has those questions. Um, and uh, so it is a higher cost as a result, you know, like a notice to reader or sorry, a compilation engagement with these financial statements, checking the accounting works and doing uh, the tax return and easily standard rates for firms can be $2,000 or 1500 Anyone who's charging like under 500 I would question whether they'd be, you know, why it's so cheap. But um, but yeah, though that adds a lot of a lot of costs to it. Uh, there are more legal costs to set up and maintain the corporation minute book. Um, you can elect via, as I put, Section A5 to move assets and goodwill over on a tax deferred basis if you start as a sole proprietor. Uh, but there is legal and tax documentation to be prepared and submitted and the costs associated. Uh, however, that's because when you dispose of something to a related party, which a corporation you own is a related party, it has to be at fair market value. So if you started a business as a sole proprietor and then you're selling it to your corporation when you set one up, you have to think, is this worth something? Would someone buy it? Because technically you'd be selling it for fair market value. You can do a rollover, uh, take back shares 
and whatnot. Um, and if CRA ever comes and argues that was maybe worth more, you can have a price adjustment clause in there to say, fine, the preferred shares are now worth half a million instead of 200,000 because you said it's worth more. I still don't owe you anything. Uh, it doesn't happen often. Um, and in a lot of cases, I, I would always use the question, well, is the tax you're likely to pay going to be more than the professional fees? And do you have, do you own a job or own a business? And um, if you own a job, it's probably not worth much. And if you own a business, it could be worth a lot. Uh, I always follow that up with the beach test. Can you go sit on a beach for two weeks and money's still rolling in or does it disappear when you do? Um, if it disappears, you own a job. Once you can just, you have the thing running in the background and you can go put up your feet and the thing's still churning out money, you have a, a proper business that you can sell. And that would also increase the fair market value rollover. Um, Cause yeah, like my business, other than maybe, you know, a client list, I disappear, you know, I have no value on, on what I'm building necessarily. Um, and there is higher accounting and tax compliance fees compared to a proprietor, but that is due to the higher level of work. So the decision tree to incorporate usually revolves around are the, what I can do with the tax savings such that uh, it is worth the extra thousand, two thousand dollars for setup and, and then annual fees to keep this going. Um, and the legal and, and also the legal liability protection in one sense, if if I framed it as if you could pay fifteen hundred dollars to make sure you don't lose your house personally because you got sued, then it's almost like the professional fees are a form of insurance um, in that sense. But it is a requirement to kind of have this in place and set up right. Um, this is where people often are not sure what to do. That's why I wanted to go over this. So people, you guys can kind of understand, okay, what are the actual differences? What do I get? Now, for a corporation, if you've already seen, sometimes I hear people say, oh, if you don't sell more than, make more than $40,000, it's not worth it. Depends. Again, there is a, the base of the cost uh, for having it. But what the part they're leaving out is, do you spend, do you need to spend personally everything you make in your business? If the answer is yes, it doesn't really matter if you have the corporation or not, because you're not accessing the 9% tax rate if you're extracting all of the profit to live your lifestyle, because you wind up having to pay personal taxes as either a wage or a dividend anyway. So you've got no tax deferral. So you've upped your professional fees, which thank you, I get paid those, so I like it, but I don't like it if the person's not getting benefit for it. Um, so you know, at that point, it doesn't matter if you're making a million dollars. If you take out a million dollars to live your life, you're paying similar to if you were a proprietor anyways. At that point, you have to look at whether the legal liability protections are kind of worth it to have it set up. Um, but that's kind of the thing. Whereas you could be making 100,000, take 40,000 out to live. You pay $40,000 of income personally, you pay tax on that amount. And the other 60, you've paid 9%, so you know $5,400, which leaves you $45,600 to invest back into the business or invest into the stock market, or you know that there's probably a $20,000 difference compared to the personal tax rates of 40% there. That could be enough to put another down payment on a rental property that you own in your corporation. So it can be very powerful if your lifestyle is supporting um, you know, that, that excess cash, if you will, to leave in the company. Uh, and that's a good problem to have. I, I like it. Um, and that's where it can get really fun when you're just trying to figure out how to spend your money. Um, but in the absence of that, the tax rate is not as advantageous as, as people might make it out to be, um, just because of, you know, you just wind up paying all that personal tax. So any questions on uh, those business structures, corporate in particular? Yeah, uh, Mike, I have oh. a question here. Sure, um, hi, John. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm kind of getting to the point where I might consider 
incorporating um but as you kind of mentioned i like being able to kind of just take that money from my own personal income um one of the biggest things here that i've heard and i'm about to have a meeting with my accountant is just the the idea of dividends and mm -hmm. i'm just not clear on that whether or not that is scheduled so i like the idea of flexibility of just being able to transfer money back and forth from my business account to my personal Okay, um, but obviously the tax rate is starting to get to me a little bit, and I'm just worried about scheduling my payments towards myself. Um, uh, slides 18 through 20 actually address that directly, so we will we okay. will get to the answer to your question then. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. Anything else, uh, Mike? I got a question here about uh, transferring assets into the corporation under Section 85. Here, yeah, um, you, you'd mention if your income's not that terribly high that uh, a filing is not uh, you know, extremely urgent in the first year. But if there were a lot of, uh, say, IP assets or whatever assets moved into the uh, corporation uh, in that first year after, say, years of uh, you know, development as a sole proprietor, uh, well, like, what's your view on that? Is that does that kind of uh, escalate the need uh, to um, uh, do an early filing? Uh, I don't see that it escalates the need for corporate tax filing. Uh, with a grain of salt, I don't necessarily know your full situation. So don't don't go and say Mike told me. Uh, but um, that would necessitate uh, probably a Section 85 rollover uh, because if those IP assets are worth something and started with a cost base of zero, if you will, and they're worth $200,000, you just using them in the corpse means that you personally have a $200,000 disposal in your with a 100,000 taxable income and probably a $40,000 tax bill on assets that were not turned into cash, but simply transferred. So that Section 85 rollover would need a particular agreement. You have to take back preferred shares redeemable for whatever your estimated fair market value is. And then you roll them over at cost, which if you develop them from nothing, uh, you know, it would be a nominal, so a dollar because they can't accept zero, but then you are rolling them into the company at a dollar with the option to redeem shares worth $200,000 in future, which would generate a dividend that you pay tax on. So it, it, it transforms it from a disposal at the time you move the assets into the corp to when you take money out and redeem those shares. Um, and those shares, which you're allowed to redeem for 200,000, reflect the balance sheet saying you have assets with a value of 200,000 and redeemable shares or equity with a value of 200,000 because it gives you the right to extract that from the company uh, and they're in balance. Um, though there's not really much reporting on the corporate tax return for that. You don't have to say there was a section 85 or anything. It's not going to generate tax. Um, the, any tax generated on transfer would be on your personal tax return, and that that would be the risk. Uh, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the rollover is something I guess I, I didn't know about, so that's that's interesting. Yeah, and there's a pretty massive uh, penalties for not doing the rollover on time, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be day one. You can roll it over later. But uh, the rollover paperwork, it's a form T2057 and needs a legal agreement um, at, with the big thing is the price adjustment clause, because that's your uh, that's your CYA clause in there. Um, and then the issued share. So there's, you know, a couple thousand or two thousand dollars you're gonna have to pay a lawyer for, which, again, if this stuff's not worth much. Uh, I would just say, you know, maybe the tax might be less than the legal fees, but with IP, it's it's hard, but you can also on the balance sheet show the fair market value of the IP and the shares on the rollover, which might help you with some financing. So you know it it depends. Uh, uh, one caveat is you don't have to do a rollover for every asset. It's only when you have assets that have increased in value. If you're like, oh, I have bought a computer three years ago for five thousand dollars, now it's worth two. Well, you just sell it to your corporation and take back a shareholder loan for your estimated fair market value. There's no inherent gain. Now, if you had a like, you know, some tool that you bought for two, it happens to be worth 10, 
then you'd need to roll it over because there's a, a gain inherent in there. Um, so again, that's what you would look at your situation, but that's a big miss that most people have when they move from a proprietor to a corporation. And the filing deadline for that form is the earlier of the tax deadline for the transferor or the transferee, the corporate or the, the proprietor, you know, and then penalties start to kick in. Make sense? Uh, yep, thanks. <laughs> for a real quick bird's eye view of a fairly complex section of the tax act. Um, Michael, just had one question around um, succession planning and corporations or incorporated entities. Uh, it seems to be a big issue for companies now and, and the concept of uh, children as it relates to incorporated entities and what the pros and cons are, how you would set that up. A um, uh, couple different things in terms of, uh, and again, depends on the situation, uh, the lawyer answer, it depends. Uh, is also the accountant answer. But in general terms, um, if you're trying to deliberately transfer a business to the next generation, uh, there used to be like, there used to be some issues with that um, in that they won't allow you to either make capital gains deductions on life, you know, stuff if it's going to related parties, et cetera, which limit it. Uh, there's some new bills that just cleared, and I think got royal assent. Some of those rules are changing uh, as of, well, I think it was Jan 1. I, I have to admit, I haven't gone and looked at them too closely, um, but there is some new guidance on that that's making it easier to transfer uh, businesses multi-generationally. A bigger issue is if you're in business with other people, and especially if they're not family or even if they are family and what happens if someone dies or gets disabled or you know or gets in an accident and goes into a coma which unfortunately has happened to some of my clients uh well why it's not like all of them but um you know or even uh if someone holds shares or, or did a rollover or preferred shares or something and they died do you trust their spouse i had one situation because uh I had one situation like that where I asked a, a brother uh, who was buying his shares and they are, we were looking at, do we just do an exchange and issue preferred shares? But if the brother who was like 63 dies, his wife would inherit the shares and she would have the right uh, to redeem them for a million dollars and the company didn't have that much cash. So it would, she could either take the company or, or have them sell all their assets to meet that. And I asked and I said, no, I, I don't trust her okay, then let's do something else. Do a loan, do this, even if it's not as tax advantageous. And the guy did die two years later, actually. So, so at least we, again, the knife wasn't in her hand. We removed it, whether or not she would have used it, but it's not an option. Uh, as far as that goes, you have to consider if someone dies and someone else inherits the shares, how can you get that out earlier? Uh, there's certain ways, one that, you know, you might just have some set, you know, fair market value agreement to buy it out. Someone else has, other partners have to get the financing or you might uh, buy insurance and pay. Oh, wow. It's already 1250. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. We have about five minutes left. Oh God. <laughs> so is there, um, maybe we could answer one more question and then maybe we could send the rest of the information to, um, to everybody who registered. What do you think about that? Or is there something that you'd like to say to wrap everything up? Uh, well, yeah, we got about halfway. Like I said, this topic okay. was always about a day. It probably should be a two hour thing. Um, <laughs> unless you want me to whip through at least top level some of the other stuff. What's your call? Well, I can, I got, I got the time. Geez, I did not notice the time going. Sorry, guys. Um, although, honestly, the business structure one's probably the more important. Well, I'll just go through, try and do it for like five minutes here as far as the income tax side. Okay, uh, marginal you. tax rates. For those of you that aren't aware, um, most of you probably are. If you move into a higher tax bracket, it's not a bad thing. You only owe the higher rate on the next dollar you make. The previous ones are still at the lower rate. So you're always better off making more money because you will, even at the higher rate, you'll still have 50 cents on the dollar you made, but that 50% tax doesn't apply on the first 200,000. Those stay the same. So you're always better off. 
There's no situation where you make more and have less cash. Um, okay. Uh, for sources of income, this one I actually wrote out. You guys can probably take a look at this, uh, particularly on dividends, because there's a whole gross up dividend tax credit based on crediting you for the corporate tax that already paid, because this is not considered a deduction corporately. Um, but I, I tried to write down a lot of com commentary on here. Um, deductible expenses. Yeah, there's no set list. You spent it to make money. I had a guy who had $100,000 a year in cigarettes, but he was in social care for people with uh, mental illness or who were in prison before, and that was a form of currency. It kept him calm. CRA audited, that was a taxable deduction. He wasn't smoking it. Um, it all depends on the circumstances. Uh, and I follow a, can I sit across from an auditor and explain the business purpose? If not, then probably don't do it because I'm not gonna do it for you. No one will. Um, there's easier ways to go to jail. Um, okay, for many of you, if you have SRED, like and the IP stuff, if those are being developed, this might be very important. This is a refundable investment tax credit. It's available to both proprietors and corporations, but corporate is way better, um, 35 versus 15%. Uh, it's applied in the corporate tax return. Uh, it's a refundable credit. Uh, there's a few calculations, but you know, at the end of the day, if you had expenses of wages of ten thousand, three thousand dollars in materials, and contract payments of five thousand, your claim would be calculated on twenty-two thousand nine hundred, and the Manitoba tax credit would be two thousand two ninety, and the federal tax credit would be seven thousand two hundred. So you would recover from the government ninety-five hundred dollars out of eighteen thousand dollars of expenses. So fifty-two point eight percent will be refunded to you. So that can be massive. Um, and you, you should find out if you qualify for what you're doing uh, and, and you know, follow that. It's very, very good for a lot of, ple a lot of businesses. Um, manufacturing investment tax credit uh, is a refundable one for corporations. In effect, it's get, if you're involved in manufacturing or production, you can recover the PST value 7% um, from it, but you can also apply it to buildings and renovations and things that might not have had PST uh, that you bought. And if it's used for manufacturing or even restaurant equipment is manufacturing, it's processing. Uh, there's the interactive digital media tax credit. If you are involved in any of these industries or project, you have to apply for this upfront and get qualified for it. You cannot claim it after the fact. Uh, so there's no forgiveness and set permission. You ask for permission and then they'll get a certificate. You can recover 40% of your costs up to. And then there's a the small business venture capital tax credit. Uh, big one is you need 25,000 in share capital. Um, you know, so issue some shares or preferred shares for 25 grand if you can upfront uh, and then apply for status. And then any Manitoba investors can get up to 45% uh, of Manitoba tax as a credit for qualifying corporate um, items. So very good. Uh, GST, HST, Manitoba RST. GST, HST, same tax, just different rates depending on place of supply, registration at 30,000. And you usually can't go back and back register. And you might want to because you get to recover GST, HST paid on expenses. Manitoba RST, the registration is 10,000. Uh, you, but you purchase RST exempt for items. Um, they actually have some good bulletins and they generally apply to all goods unless there's a rule that says they don't and services, no services unless there's a rule that says they do. The place of supply rules, I covered that before, but you can look at the examples. Uh, it's basically where the, it, where the person takes possession, if it's a good or where the customer is located, if it's a service. Uh, and that applies to RST and GST. Um, so, and that, so it's not, oh, I'm in Manitoba, the customer is in Ontario. If you're shipping to a worksite in Alberta, you bill by Alberta. Uh, these are actually fairly simple ones you guys can go through. Uh, self assessing, if you bring things in, you have to self assess 7% on the asset unless it's exempt. Um, remuneration, uh, do I have two more minutes, Tina, just to fly through this quick? It's like the last piece. 
Yeah, we'll make it happen. Okay, thanks. Um, I should put this one up earlier. It's in view one. Okay, if you're a corporation, you have a few options based on business structure. For sole proprietors and partnerships, joint ventures, you got nothing. Just what you make, here's your tax. Doesn't matter how you spent the money. Um, with corporation, you can choose wages or bonus. The pros here, it's a straight deduction to the corporation income to yourself. So it's tax efficient. There's no double tax, no tax bleed because it's, it's a straight minus one plus one. Uh, it provides you RSP contribution room and CPP benefits later. And you can record an expense in the corporation as a wage payable, deduct it at your year end. And so long as you pay it, usually by sending in source deductions within 180 days, it, you can get the deduction early, but you can actually have the income show up six months later. If you have a non-calendar year end, that would actually allow you to, or even a calendar year end, that would let you deduct in one year and then record the wage in another for the T4. Cons, you have to pay the employee employer portion of CPP, similar to a proprietorship. And if you don't care about the CPP, it's an extra $6,000 plus per year if you're doing wages. And you have to be proactive to avoid penalties, which can be su substantial, uh, at least enough to cover the CPP. The income tax withholding doesn't really matter as much. You can't backdate a wage because the you have to have made a source deduction by the deadline um, to say that a wage was paid. Even if the wage wasn't paid and you took a draw, CRA will look at when they got the money. For dividends, you can backdate based on drawings to year end after crediting for expense. So to uh, John's question there, you don't really need to plan a dividend. Like if you take five, a bunch of money throughout the year and I'm doing a year end two months after year end, I say, oh, hello, you pulled $70,000. So we'll record a dividend for 70 grand and that's going to be your, your income. And we'll, we'll report it at year end and we'll issue you a T5 slip for your personal tax return. So you don't have to say this is a dividend, that's a dividend, that's a dividend. It's a draw. And the dividend part will kind of compensate for the draw. And there's no CPP contributions required because a dividend is not earned income. No source deductions either. Uh, so there's nothing that says you have to send money to Siri when you pay a dividend. One problem is it doesn't create additional CPP benefits or RSP contribution room. It does have a slight tax bleed due to the way the gross ups and the tax rates work if tax rates have changed since the dividend tax rate rules are in place. Um, and you also can't claim childcare expenses if you have them uh, for against dividend income. Uh, again, no proper right way to do it. It comes down to the CPP question a lot of times. Uh, I don't know if it's better or not unless you can tell me when you're going to die. Um, because if you die before drawing CPP, you lose a lot of what you contributed. You only get $2,500 payout. If you live to 95, you will probably get more than if what you could make you know, via the CPP. Uh, one question I usually have is, are you a spender or a saver? If you're a saver and you don't want to contribute to CPP, you'd rather build up your own nest egg, do it. Otherwise, um, if you know you're gonna spend, forced retirement savings so you don't go bankrupt at 80 might be a good idea. It's up to your choice. And finally, shareholder loans, function of contributions, they're tax paid money in, you can take them tax paid out. Um, and then you can cover them with wages or dividends if you need to. Okay, that was a bit of a, a sprint there. Sorry about that, guys. No, that was wonderful. Thank you so very much, Michael. Really appreciate you uh, diving deep into helping us understand the steps we need to take uh, to fill our business taxes, uh, to file our business taxes and for answering everybody's questions. Yeah. Um, if I could get you to uh, stop sharing, that would be great. Okay. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining the, uh, for being a part of the North Fort Discovery Series. This concludes the second of two webinars uh, about income and sales tax. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at future North Forge events. Uh, if you want to follow us on Eventbrite, uh, you'll get a notification of when our next event uh, goes up and we'll totally, uh, we'd, we'd love to see you there. Check your email for today's webinar resources, as well as the link to the YouTube video. Sometimes the email goes to your spam or your junk folder, so check that out. And before we wrap up for the day, we'd like to thank our sponsors, 6P Marketing, 
Bell MTS, Bitspace Development, Boxstall Construction, Princess Auto, RBCX, Stu Clark Center for Entrepreneurship at the University of Manitoba, and TDS Law. And that's a wrap. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Take care.